Well, thanks everybody for coming to join us to celebrate our 30th anniversary. Um, I think it's kind of wild that it's 30 years. Um, I wasn't quite a 30 year member. This is really my 28th year, which is still pretty, uh, pretty long time. Um, but it's hitting home. I just had my 30th uh, a college reunion and now we're celebrating Gizmo's 30th year. So it's really an amazing achievement. Um, so glad everybody could, uh, could join us for that. Um, a little bit of housekeeping. We're on Zoom. Uh, all of you probably are, you know, Zoom experts at this point with the pandemic and everybody working from home. Uh, but we wanted to let you know how that we're, how we're going to be taking care of the um, the event tonight. Uh, all of the participants right now are going to stay muted unless they're uh, they're directed to speak. So when they have you know a talk that they're giving or when we're doing a Q and A, then we will unmute you so that you can speak. Um, and the participants. Um, should keep themselves muted um, until you know you have a chance to unmute yourself. Um, we are going to be using the raise hand feature during the question and answer session, but we're asking everybody to keep your questions to the very end. Um, we're going to have a kind of a panel session at the very end where we're going to um, open up the stage for questions. Um, to find the raise hand feature, it's a little bit different depending on whether you're using an iPad, tablet, or a, um, a desktop version of Zoom, so you'll, you'll probably have to take a look for it. Um, in the participants tab, you should be able to see a little blue hand that kind of looks like that. Um, and then when we see that you have a question during the Q&A period, we'll call on you um, and make sure that you're unmuted and then muted when um, you're done. And that'll, that'll keep a lot of, you know, um, background noises, you know, now that, um, you know, we're back to noisy New York, you know, opening, there was a lot of construction today. Uh, so we want to make sure that we keep that quiet. Um, you can use the chat window to chat with each other. Um, I love seeing encouragement. I love seeing, you know, uh, some, you know, insights there that you might have that you could add to the discussion. Um, and you can also use the chat window to introduce yourself. So I'm going to do that right now. I'll put my name in there and wave hi. Um, and everybody else, go ahead and, and do that. Um, the agenda uh, is going to be these greetings and introductions followed by a talk by Jack Eichenbaum, who's our founder, who's been um, leading us for so many uh, decades already. Um, he's gonna talk about the uh, history of Gizmo and our founding principles, and we'll follow that with a virtual toast. And I hope that you take a little bit of moment before we start um, to go get a beverage of your choice. This is just water, it's very hot, so that's all I'm taking right now. <laughs> Um, I was telling them earlier, I was uh, moderating a uh, event on Zoom that was on Amsterdam time um, and it was like 11 a.m. and they were already on cocktail. I was like, nah, it's going to have to wait until much later. Um, so we'll have some updates um, from Wendy Dorf, who's one of our uh, Gizmo board members, um, and Alan Leitner, who is our Gizmo president, um, followed by some presentations on GIS and COVID from New York State GIO Frank Winters on the value of GIS in the pandemic. Uh, Sean Ahern, who is a professor and uh, director of the Carsey Lab at Hunter College, who's going to talk about the geospatial tirade and, and COVID-19. Um, and then George Percival is going to give us a, um, a talk. He's the chief technology officer of OGC, uh, the Open Geospatial Council. And he will present geospatial data science considering COVID-19. And after all of that, um, we'll do like a little virtual round of applause. It's best not to clap because it can get really loud and get in everybody's ears. We can do like a little beatnik thing or we can wave hands um, and that'll save some ears. So let's try to do that. Um, and I guess now we can take it away to, um, you know, our, our uh, program. Oh, we have another, um, yeah, this is how you can find us. We're on YouTube, we're on Facebook, we're on Twitter. Uh, so look for us there. Um, if you're not a member yet, it's only $20. It gets you also a membership to the New York GIS Association, um, and it's free for students. So that's, um, that's really great to be able to offer that to our student members. Um, and these are our board of directors, uh, Alan Leidner, Wendy Dorf, Jack Eichenbaum, our founder, Camille Stewart, our tre treasurer um, and student member, uh, Amy Chu, Julianne Mante, Darren Mendelhoff, 
Jin Wen, myself, Noreen Weisel, and Doug Williamson. So any questions that you might have about Gizmo that you'd like to ask any of us, any of the board members can answer those questions for you. And I think we're ready to introduce our first speaker. Alan, do you want to do the honors? Um, I am the first speaker. You are the first. Oh, I thought Jack was going to be the first speaker. Uh, he, he is after I speak. Okay, so well, you I, go I then. Take, <laughs> I'm just going to make a little presidential opening statement. I also want to recognize Camille Stewart um, and, uh, and uh, Wayming Chan, who are both officers and support uh, um, the board of directors and the president. So I want to call them out as well. I want to greet everyone uh, uh, on my behalf and on behalf of the board and the officers. Um, you know, the coronavirus uh, pandemic has forced us uh, to take this celebration online, this 30 year celebration. But if we're nothing else, it's resilient and adaptable. So here we are, and this is actually quite an attractive venue and no one has to travel to it other than virtually. Um, so I'm just gonna, um, speak a little bit about the last 30 years of Gizmo without stepping on Jack's toes. I just simply want to say that uh, we've had a very successful organization that has not only brought people together, but has also done things. For example, Gizmo was absolutely essential for the development of the New York City base map. Without um, Gizmo, uh, the GIS response to 9-11 would have been diminished. We uh, and Jack's efforts and Wendy's efforts recruited dozens and dozens of people to work on 9-11 on Pier 92. We've been building relationships both uh, with Noreen's Cogito, which is the coalition of rural organizations related to GIS in New York City. But we've also built uh, very strong ties to the New York State GIS Association and to the Open Geospatial Consortium. And most recently, uh, we have really been actively engaged in the COVID-19 response. Just as an example, we have identified 115 GIS-trained individuals who all indicated that they would be willing to work on COVID-related items. And we've made uh, those names available to a number of agencies and also to the contract uh, tracing program going on in the city and in surrounding suburbs. Uh, we also have held dozens of events, GIS application fairs, GIS job fairs, open data forums, uh, getting distinguished speakers in to speak uh, about technology. So um, we've done a lot of work for 30 years. Um, we have a great future ahead of us because the technology is exploding with underground infrastructure mapping and advanced sensor technologies and artificial intelligence. They're all geospatially oriented. So GIS and Gizmo will continue to be essential for the foreseeable future. Um, and now what I'd like to do, it's a great honor really to introduce Jack Eichenbaum, um, who has a PhD in geography. He helped introduce GIS to New York City's Department of Finance and to the city as a whole. Jack founded Gizmo 30 years ago and served as president for many years. He led the effort to bring dozens of volunteers to support the GIS response to 9-11. Now he serves as the Queensboro historian and leads geographically oriented walking tours across the city. So uh, Jack, um, the stage is yours, take it away. Thank you, Alan. This is a very proud day for me. Um, and I actually started using GIS, believe it or not, probably before at least a third of you were born. And I'm talking about, um, I'm a graduate student in geography in 1970, and GIS was not called it then, it was called computerized cartography. And one of the fathers of computerized cartography, some of you may have run into the name Waldo Tobler, was on my committee at the University of Michigan. And I was able to use a very primitive form of, GR, of GIS. My study at the time was my PhD dissertation. Dissertation was on, was about 270 families who were forced to move because of an urban renewal project in Detroit. Remember urban renewal? That's before your time too. But 270 families were forced to move and my job was to find out why. And I was able to print out on maps point distributions of these families 
by ethnicity, by race, by education, by income, et cetera, and, and support various theories that I had about how people move when they're forced to move. That was primitive GIS. I could only put, print out these point distributions and, I, and boundary files didn't exist. I, I overlaid these point distributions with mylar maps so I could tell where these, where these point, distributions, point distributions were in the real world. And that was the state of GIS in 1970, but it existed as computerized cartography. In 1982, I started working for the New York City Department of Finance as it was beginning to computerize the property valuation system. I spent three years in the field, and as an urban geographer, those were three great years. My group took a photograph of every parcel, tax parcel in the city of New York, about a million tax parcels in the city of New York. I worked in every borough. And we also collected data on 600,000 one, two, and three family homes. Those are the simplest kinds of properties in New York City and the ones that are most amenable to a computerized valuation system. I collected that data. I mean, collecting data in the city, in the city of New York, along with a good sense of urban geography and its principle was just wonderful. I mean, I loved being in the field and I learned so much about the city in that phase of my work with the Department of Finance. In 1985, I moved into the office. We got the first PCs and we began to study how we would model the valuation of property. In 1988, we were able to use the first PC GIS, which was not ARC Info, it was Map Info. Map Info was a program that was devised by people who had actually worked in the Department of City Planning in New York, and they moved up to Troy, New York, and at one, one, at one World Plaza in, in Troy, New York, they established their offices, and I remember going up there with several of the people that I worked with for training and how to use their PCGIS, which was called our, uh, uh, map info. And it was an enormous help in solving our problem, which is figuring out the location components of property value. You know, in New York, everything is location, 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 and you can get a good, somewhat good idea of how much a property is worth by knowing how big it is, and what the construction quality is, and what the house looks like, and whatever. But the most important part is location. The same house put in Brownsville is worth a lot less than the house is in Williamsburg, and that same house, if you put it on the Upper East Side, is probably worth 10 or 20 times as much. So the location component of, Gia, of a piece of property was extremely important. And in doing this, we also needed to know all kinds of things that we didn't realize that we had to know. We needed to know crime rates. We needed to know about historic districts. We needed to know all kinds of data that we didn't have in our files. So it was important for me to gather data from other city agencies. And if you've worked in a city agency or you've worked in a department in an academic institution, you know that you're siloed. Most of your uh, the ways that you are promoted are working with people inside your own silo. Most of the most of the most of your knowledge is from your cohorts. You don't get a chance to work across the board. Who works across the board? The commissioners. The, the rank and file workers do not. But I saw that what we needed to learn from, we needed to learn from one another that people using the same technology, which was GIS and people using the, this, this ARC, this, excuse me, this map info product existed in different agencies. And map info shared their user database with me. And I got in touch with other users, particularly in DEP, in the health department and in city planning and in May of 1990, we had the first meeting of Gizmo. 
the great success of Gizmo, I think, was due to its name. It was a catchy name. We spell it with an S because it referred to geographic information systems as opposed to a Z, which is the way the word, the word Gizmo is spelled. But Gizmo was a success from the very beginning, first among city people from city agencies, but later we realized it doesn't have to be just city agencies. Why not nonprofits? We were early adopted by the Fund for the City of New York, which was studying some of the same things. The Fund adopted us, gave us free lunches, and enabled to, us to get together on their premises. Um, and people who uh, used GIS began to talk to one another. In Gizmo meetings, we began to share technology. Most of all, we became friends with one another and we were able to informally, not formally, share data with one another. So the early days were like getting to know you, getting to realizing that GIS was bigger than just you working in your department, but it was you working with people in other agencies. And quickly it was meant it was working with people in nonprofit organizations like the Fund for the City of New York and various academic departments. And then we realized, oh, we need other, other levels of government. We started working with people who work for the New York State government in New York City and with the census, which is federal government, but also worked in New York City. We also went finally further, well, why not work for the private sector? And within three years, by 1993, we had people who were working with and using GIS everywhere in New York City. And that was wonderful. And we had an organization that began to function with people becoming friends with one another. Some of my best friends became my Gizmo friends. All right, so that's, those are the early days of Gizmo. By the end of the 1990s, email becomes universal. And by the year 2000, just about everybody who was in Gizmo had an email address. This, was to pro this proved to be very useful in 2001. In 2001, you may remember that something really terrible happened in New York. 9-11-2001, when the, twi when the uh, two twin towers of the tra World Trade Center were destroyed and there was mass chaos in New York. <laughs> The FEMA set up a response to that mass chaos on a pier on the west side of New York, along the Hudson River. And for, I sent out one email to all the Gizmo people. And for three months, 24 seven, people were, who were connected to Gizmo worked for around the clock to produce maps that were needed by the different agencies of the city and the state and the federal government. And Al can talk more about that. I couldn't be there because I was using MapInfo and they were all using ArcInfo, but I did send that letter out and I visited from time to time and it was an amazing scene, which my friend Al Leidner can tell you about. Okay, let me fast forward to recent years. Gizmo was very, very successful in dealing with early emergencies like 9-11 and then later with hurricanes and flooding and whatever, super storm static sandy. We are at a we are at an impasse now. We've got a big emergency scheduled uh, called the COVID, COVID-19, but we're not I, we're not able to access the data. The data is being kept secret by the Department of Health, and we have not been able to get into that data. Some of us know very much about how that illness may be uh, spread, but we are unable to test our theories because the, the data is not available to us on the granular level of the, of the individual parcel or the individual building. The best we can do is look at data on the, the, on the uh, level of the zip code, which really doesn't tell you that much. Gizmo has new frontiers. I actually, I had thought about these things when I first started Gizmo, but we have some very, very important frontiers now. When we started getting to know one another and technology was the big thing. We're way ahead on technology. You passed me by. 
I was I was in front of I was in front of the technology curve 30 years ago. I'm way behind now. I have been officially retired from city government for 12 years. I don't have the latest programs of anything, but I do th I do think that I'm still up to date on what our problems are. And one of our biggest problems is the fact that data is still collected by political different different political areas. If you cross the Queens-Nassau border, or if you cross the Bronx-Westchester border, the data that's available is in a completely different form. Our data does not easily cross political boundaries. And even those variables that do cross political boundaries are often collected differently and are not updated by the same schedule. Data does not cross political boundaries, and this is something that we must face. We have to make sure that our data definitions cross political boundaries and that we co-update uh, data across political boundaries. A terrible problem that we really haven't gone far enough to solve at all. But the crossing of political boundaries with data. Other frontiers of GIS are getting away from just GIS's two dimensions. We got to see GIS in three dimensions, and we're doing that already. I know Alan Wendy will talk about uh, underground infrastructure. Other people are talking about GIS in the atmosphere, and there are many people who are looking at buildings in terms of three dimensional, the architecture, the shadows, and whatever. Then there's the fourth dimension, and that's the dimension of time, looking at GIS over time, and the product is a GIS movie to get away from a single GIS map and look at variables of buildings or whatever you're studying on a map in function. And I, I have already seen some COVID. You have probably have seen on television, you've seen the spread of the COVID virus over time. Anyway, that's another frontier. So when I, when I look at GIS today, I think of the two major frontiers for us are GIS in three and four dimensions, and moving GIS data across political boundaries. And that's what I mostly want to say, but I'm so glad you're here. I, this has been the 23 of the 23 years that I have worked for city government. Gizmo is the most important thing I did. And it's so good to see you all here. Um, it's, it warms my heart. Thank you. We Al, you got to put your mic on. I was Jack. You need to propose a toast. Let me get. Just do it virtually with your hand. I was supposed to raise a toast, which I forgot about. Alan, you need to you need to advance the, the slide. Best thing I, I can think we have a slide. The oh, best, right. The best thing I can toast you with is has something to do with, with the agency that Al worked for for a number of years, and that was DEP. And DEP pro protects our water supply, and I am toasting with great. New York City water, which is so good. I remember when I was a kid, we had relatives in Philadelphia, and we'd go down to Philadelphia re 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 uh, regularly, and my mother couldn't drink the coffee. If you know a little bit of Yiddish, my mother would say, this coffee is Pishach. Philadelphia water was terrible. New York water was great. In, at one point, they even had, can, you could buy a can of New York water in Los Angeles. Anyway, here's to Gizmo, another 30 years. To Gizmo, another 30 years. 
more to do. <laughs> okay, Jack, thank you so much. You've been a, a, really an inspiration and um, a solid foundation for us for uh, all these 30 years and for 30 years to come. Um, so I'd like to now move the program on to um, have Wendy Dorf say a few words um, about a legislative initiative that we've been pushing for at least a year. Wendy directed the Waterman Digital Mapping Project for the Department of Environmental Protection way back in the 80s. She helped develop the city's base map. She directed the Deep Infrastructure Group on Pier 92 following 9-11. Uh, she continues to work to map the underground, and we've worked that one as colleagues for maybe 15, 20 years. And she is also coordinating the City Council GIS legislation, which we she will now talk about. So Wendy, go ahead. Alan, I know I'm on a short, am I up? Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. I know I just have a few minutes, but I just want to have, I have a few comments I'd like to make about 30 years. That's okay with everybody. Um, happy 30th anniversary, Gizmo, and thank you, Jack Eichenbaum for starting an organization that gave voice to a rather new technology at the time, and one that is now institutionalized throughout the city and critical to its decision-making. When a colleague dragged me into one of the earliest Gizmo lunch meetings, I never dreamed that we were experiencing the dawn of a revolutionary change in the way mapping would enable data sharing and analysis to improve all of the city's business. Moreover, the meetings brought together geospatial professionals in the public and private sectors and served as a forum to share new applications and work together. Today's presentations will illustrate the model developed 30 years ago. Our collegiality has extended over the years. Each of our distinguished speakers has contributed to the advantage, advancement of GIS for decades through the development of application. Thank you, Sean, George, and Frank, for your tenacity and generous availability in the best and worst of times. It has been a joy and inspiring to work with each of you. Also, many thanks to Alan and the outstanding board of directors on which I am proud to serve. Alan is tirelessly in, tireless in his advocacy of GIS, working together, advocating for projects that can be exhausting, but even the small wins make it worthwhile. As to the board, Thank you all. I believe that this is the best Gizmo board ever so far. As a senior member, I feel optimistic that your individuality, expertise, and collegiality will make the next 30 years even better. So now, now to the legislation. As you know, several members of the board testified before the Charter Revision Commission over a year ago in support of the Dewey Charter Editions requesting the appointment of a Chief Geospatial Information Officer as Deputy Commissioner, development of a spatial data interoperability strategy for the City of New York, including the development and maintenance of a strategic plan for the City's use of geospatial information services, and also convening under the, th the authority of the CGIO, regular meetings of agency GIS managers and other geospatial experts to enable proper citywide coordination and collaboration in areas, including application development, data sharing, and data interoperability. Alan and I met with council member Levin, uh, and he said to us that the best way to go would be that the addition should be legislated. Council legal staff rewrote the additions reviewed the text and it was expected that the legislation would be introduced on April 7th. There are other people that they were looking for to co-sign the introductory legislation. Uh, one of them was Gail Brewer and the other is uh, Bob, Robert Holder who we met through Jack Eichenbaum. And um, up until about a minute before this meeting, I didn't really speak to Steve. Uh, to actually find out what was happening. I, we knew that the legislation was supposed to have been introduced on April 7th, and uh, um, council was closed, did not reopen uh, until a week later, and they've been Zooming mostly about uh, the city budget and COVID-related issues. Steve called a minute before actually to discuss COVID, and I said, oh my God, I need the latest uh, situation with the legislation. Unfortunately, they've really been stuck on the, uh, in the COVID and the 
the uh, budget hearings, um, but it's pending. Um, and so it, it, he, it will be introduced and he is seeking, you know, co-sponsors uh, as we had discussed before. So I guess we all have to be patient. It's on his radar screen and uh, sooner or later, the, the bill will be, will, will be presented and passed. And uh, thank all of you for everything over the years. I mean, this is a terrific moment. And Jack, uh, wow, terrific. Congrats. Thanks, Wendy. Um, and I would just add that there aren't very many local or municipal GIS organizations anywhere in the country that actually are going out and sponsoring legislation. I think it's sort of a unique um, effort on the part of Gizmo. And if you're looking for a reason to join Gizmo, this is one of them, is the fact that we're activists, they are trying to get things done, and we're trying to create conditions to improve everyone's career. So if anyone on this uh, call, uh, this Zoom, uh, is not a Gizmo member, of course, if you're a student, you just sign up at the Gizmo website for free. But if you're working and making a salary, it's $20 a year for Gizmo membership and for also membership in the New York State GIS Association. So um, just got a terrific reason from Wendy why you should join. Uh, what I'm going to do now, I'm going to briefly talk about another initiative that was started by Gizmo, uh, the mapping of the underground. I refer to it as the last frontier of data. Um, in urban America because it's so poorly mapped. Uh, there's no data standards, um, data is incomplete, and yet it's such an essential series of systems that supports all life in the city. Um, so uh, soon the vision for this, basically speaking, is to get all the infrastructure above ground and, uh, and below ground uh, to be registered to a common base map with a common data model and to have all the data associated with those infrastructure layers associated with each other. And then associated, of course, with buildings and with BIM and everything else that the underground infrastructure connects to. So it's a pretty big vision, uh, but we found a lot of um, friends to support us and we're starting to move forward. Um, once this vision sort of was, was spelled out, and this was 20 years ago, well, 9-11 happened. And this is the picture of the Emergency Mapping and Data Center populated by a lot of people that Jack Eichenbaum, you know, and Wendy Dorf, you know, got to come. Uh, and one of the big operations was the Deep Infrastructure Group. And Wendy Dorf managed that group. And one of the things that they accomplished, among many, many things, was to find a 200,000-pound a tank of Freon, a liquid that was part of the cooling system of the World Trade Center, uh, found where it was underground, related it to where the fires were burning underground by using thermal imagery, and were able to prevent that tank from exploding, which would have released phosgene gas, and been a whole other disaster on top of uh, the, the collapse of the World Trade Centers. So that's just an example of why mapping underground infrastructure is so important why connecting it to building information management systems is also important uh, happily in 2017 after a lot of frustrated efforts by wendy myself and jim mcconnell who was then uh, a head of gis for oem we teamed up with george percival who will be speaking later and uh, the open geospatial consortium which is the international standard gis standard setting body uh, and uh, they agreed with us and we agreed with them that infrastructure needed to be done. And the consequence of that, after a couple of years of work and meetings, was that we now have a model called a bloody model, model for underground data definition and integration for the entire underground infrastructure realm. This is like a major first step which is getting uh, this done and having the different infrastructure data. Um, uh, actually uh, standardized so we can be brought together on a base map. Uh, New York City Do It uh, actually did a small pilot of this, uh, and we're very ha happy that Erica and, and Tim Keene and uh, Don Sunderland, you know, went out and uh, actually piloted this, and um, we hope that this project takes it to the next step um, so that we could 
just keep moving. And, and in fact, Wendy and I are in negotiations now with a number of other add-on initiatives. The uh, objective, again, is to bring underground infrastructure, GIS for underground infrastructure, together with BIM so that we can basically model the entire built environment. And hopefully, if we can do it in New York, we can do it everywhere. Um, so that's where we are. We're in negotiations. We're working towards this goal. We have a data model. We even have a cost-benefit assessment. Um, and we believe that there is sense to have this done. And what this will do is open up all the potential value for smart city applications, including the use of sensors, smart files, smart pipes, smart conduit, and smart connections, and artificial intelligence. So there you have it again. This is a gizmo initiative done with the Open Geospatial Consortium. Not many other local GIS organizations are doing anything quite as bold as this. So again, another reason, join gizmo if you're not a member. Um, okay, so enough, enough for me for now. I'm gonna stop, maybe we'll hold it here because our next speaker is gonna be um, Frank Winters, who is the uh, GIO of New York State. Frank has worked for more than 25 years as a GIS technician and manager in the public sector. Uh, he is the GIO, and he is also, most importantly, because this has national implications, he is the incoming president of the National States Geographical Information Council, which is the GIOs of all states across the country. So, um, you know, we got a New York State guy who's heading uh, that national organization of 50 states, and uh, we're very hopeful because we know know Frank and the kind of person he is, and we know this is going to have tremendous implications for GIS across the country. So with that, I'm going to stop sharing, or maybe I'll leave it, right? Frank, you don't have any slides, so you can just speak. Well, yeah, Al, if you do stop, uh, stop sharing, I can go to gallery view and see everyone's smiley face, too. But will I ever be able to share again? Well, Sean is going to share his <laughs> application next. So I don't have to, I can stop worrying now about sharing. So I'm going to stop sharing. There you are. Take it away, Frank. All right. Hey, uh, thank you very much. I mean, one of the most powerful words we can use is grateful. And I am grateful to be here. But first, I'm grateful that this group exists. And I'm particularly grateful to be here because you know, I'm a guy from Albany, right? And, and the city and the state um, uh, don't collaborate in a lot of areas, but the welcomeness that I've felt from Gizmo and, and the inclusion has just been empowering. So it's, it's really, um, I really thank you, um, you know, because we, we start as a, a collaborative technology as collaborators. But um, hey, I, I wanna give you a few thoughts. Um, and there's a reoccurring theme that's happened throughout my career. And that is, as geographers and as GIS professionals, I, I find that we're not very content. And you know, we're proud of what we do for a minute, and then it's like, oh, we want to contribute more. And sometimes that feeling is overwhelming. And you know, to, to that extent, when when this COVID thing happened, I was pretty proud of of um, how my team was working, and I was proud of proud of our community because I knew we had lots of people to uh, rely on. But you know, just um, we were doing good work in mapping traffic patterns for drive-through sites. We were we were mapping um, distribution uh, problems, and and we were doing you know supporting the incident management team, the office of emergency management for the state, and we have people around the clock sharing a cell phone. And when the governor needs a map for the pre for his press events, those maps come from my team. And you know, but we were kind of just doing that in second gear. And I had this really disconcerting feeling and a really unsettling feeling. And I have to give hats off to Gizmo and the New York State GIS Association because that really sparked my resolve to help me get my, you know, my thoughts around what those, what those feelings were. Now, I haven't lost sleep over work very often, maybe once a decade, but I started to lose sleep. And I was like, what is going on? Are we not being asked for the most impactful contribution we could make? Um, sure, what we're doing is important, but there's so much more. And that was that that uh, discontent. We're not content as an industry to just keep making the same contribution. So, it, you know, the, it kind of came around to these sound bites. And like like Jack said, um, 
the, uh, the spread of this disease and its impact are best understood in the context of space and time. And we started to, uh, started to hear some stories and through conversations, um, starting here uh, in New York City, I understood that, hey, the spread of this disease is not homogeneous over large areas, certainly not over a county, certainly not over a state. And um, uh, Al told a story, the Upper West Side, where people are, are um, behind their laptops and working from home. And maybe they're ordering their groceries to be brought in. The spread of the disease is relatively low. And you walk a, a few blocks away, and you've got people that have an entirely different life situation. And maybe they have a choice of social distancing or feeding their family, right? So they're mixing it up on the subway, and they're doing their thing. And, and those, those impacts, those things that we can we can drive to really enlighten decision and policy are, are mass when we start to treat data as homogeneous over large areas. Well, also the impact of the disease, we can't expect to be homogeneous. Um, I was talking to my friends in New Orleans and why is New Orleans suffering more hospitalization and more death per person with COVID than New York City? Is it a difference in healthcare? I think it's really a difference in the pre-existing uh, comorbidities that exist, all of that is already mapped at census track, for instance. So we could not only have better indications of the spread of the disease, but the severity. And when we mix those two, now all of our vision becomes blurred. So mixing the spread of the disease and its impact is really what we get when we start to look at data, um, just looking at hospitalization, right? So we, so pulling those things apart. And really the foundation of all of that is the address. And we are really grateful again for the partnerships we've had across the state. Every addressing authority, including New York City, works with our team uh, routinely to help us maintain a set of 9 million address points around the state. So are those addresses being validated when there's fingers on keyboards and when somebody's entering that data for the first time? I hear on the news that they, you know, about a month ago, they tested 20,000 people for antibodies at grocery stores. It's like, ah, oh, awesome. There's 19,000 addresses that somebody's got to clean up, right? And that's just the way I'm thinking like, oh, we, we need to be ahead of this. So, you know, again, the unsettled feeling, um, but that really goes to the spatial resolution. And echoing, and Jack and I didn't talk before this, but the temporal resolution, how, how are we able to resolve over time the differences? The temporal resolution, there's wonderful opportunities for us here. We could take one measurement at a sewage treatment plant every day or twice a day, and we could measure the relative COVID rate across a huge population, everyone in that sewer shed. The concept of a sewer shed is not um, foreign to us uh, as geographers, but it might be to people that aren't thinking spatially. And then is the way that we measure the sewer shed and correct for flow the same as Philadelphia and the same as Los Angeles, and, and can we compare all that? Well, we have the opportunity to come together as a community to do that. So temporal resolution is um, a key thing. So um, I'm happy to say that really sparked by these conversations through this group and the association in, in collaboration with the association, we were able to fire up a joint statement through NISGIC and NISGIC's the National States Geographic Information Council and uh, ERISA OGC, Association of American Geographers, um, and most importantly, Gizmo, uh, as well as uh, some, <laughs> uh, five other or six other organizations, all co-signed that joint statement. And uh, that was a, a, a good statement. We got uh, plenty of news on that. But then to have life, it's not a one and done. To have life beyond that, uh, we fired up the Pandemic GIS Task Force with two members from NAPSIG, National Association of Public Safety, GIS, uh, NISGIC, and URISA, and uh, as well as their executive directors. And we've been meeting every Wednesday, really pretty efficient uh, meetings. In fact, I had one ear bud on that uh, meeting and one ear bud on this meeting as we we're starting to get this lined up this afternoon. And what we're gonna come up with is a couple of things. One is um, I invite you all to participate and reach out to any of your folks in public health and an emergency response to participate on the um, uh, the 23rd of June for the uh, COVID GIS hot wash. And we're really bringing together the public health community, the emergency response community, and the GIS community 
to really take the poll, take the pulse of that all those organizations, find out what's working, find out what's lacking, and really line it up so that we're so we're uh, in the game and and um, making these efforts. And and we can really by the by the way we uh, craft a survey, we can incentivize the right action. Like, are you collecting addresses related to cases? Cool. Are you validating them? Do you plan to use them for anything? <laughs> you know, so just by begging those questions, like, oh yeah, we should really be doing that. Are you collecting it to a true question? Maybe we should do that. So those are the things that um, we're, we're gonna pull together during the hot wash and then for a, a survey afterward. And what we're gonna wind up with is the pandemic GIS uh, playbook. And we're gonna try to cross-reference that with other uh, just general pandemic playbooks. So when the public health community is looking through what we're going to um, uh, do nationwide or in our jurisdictions, um, it'll reference back to, if done right, oh, and for this activity, here's how we connect with the geography and here's the people that, that line that up. So it's not just us preaching to the choir. And it really comes down to um, getting the data out in the hands of the people that need it. When you make data available, um, all kinds of things that I'm not smart enough to predict happen. So I'll leave you with this um, catchphrase. After I, I I'm not gonna, uh, you're not gonna be able to see it, but I have a acid etched New York State GIS punch, uh, pint glass uh, to toast uh, with you all. My son made this, a geography student on his way uh, right now from University of Denver to start his first GIS job in the Washington DC area. So um, uh, a cheers to you with that. And uh, I'll leave you with this uh, little sound bite. Data is just like love. It only finds its true value when you give it away. Here's to uh, Gizmo, 30 years. Okay, I get, I can talk. Frank, thanks so much. Thanks so much for 30 years of collaboration with you and your office up in the state. I think that's one of the great things about GIS is that it seems to attract people that like working with people. Um, and um, we've played that to the hilt, you've played that to the hilt, and we have a great collaboration going, and we'll keep that up. Um, now, I'd like to move on to Professor Sean Ahern. Um, Sean is prof Professor of Geography at Hunter College and Director of the Center for Advanced Research of Spatial Information. He's a key architect of the city's base map, successfully modeled West Nile virus to the point of actually saving lives and, and uh, stopping it from being a problem, at least in New York City. He provided essential leadership and technical services following 9-11. Um, he also served as the president of the University Consortium of GIS uh, and on the National Geographic Advisory Committee. He continues his research to this day. He's been, I don't know what we would have done in GIS without uh, Sean and his intelligence and his technical understanding of things and his energy. So, um, Sean, take it away. All yours. Hi. Thanks very much for your kind words, Al. Um, I, uh, I, I, it's really impressive that Gizmo has been around 30 years. The years go fast. Congratulations, Jack and the board. Uh, Gizmo's really been an enduring thread in the GIS community that I think has given us the coherence that many cities do not have. Um, and you can see the initiatives that are underway, incredibly impressive. Um, so I'm going to be talking today about um, modeling um, and geocoding and proximity tracing and spatial diffusion. Um, and you know, the goal, the essential goal here is to understand and reduce transmission. Uh, where is the origin of infected in individuals? That's geocoding. What individuals have they come into contact? That's contact tracing. What is the transmission rate of individuals? Uh, in, in the epidemiology world, it's called rho, and it's if I'm infected, how many individuals do I infect? And the other is, how dispersed is the movement of individuals? And this you could think of as a, a the diffusion of, of the disease. Um, and so we want to reduce transmission and we want to work on modeling and prediction to try to understand what's happening and where. So the challenge of geocoding is to collect, get clean data at the source. Uh, 
Geocoded data equals geographic specificity of analysis and understanding. We, I'm preaching to the choir, but we still have to say that. Uh, and key to the C19 spread attenuation is geocoded data. Um, what do we need to do? We need to create data apps for hospitals and other intake centers uh, that doesn't add to their overhead, um, doesn't add overhead to their existing processes. And Al and I have talked about barcode reading, licenses, easy pass, you name it. Um, so what's the action item? Understand the workflow and different entities involved and optimal solutions for obtaining clean address data at the source that minimizes overhead to organizations. Why is geographic specificity important? Again, I don't have to tell you guys. This is a, a slide, a figure I grabbed out of Jason Urias's uh, final report from my class. Uh, and what he did is something very simple, but uh, strong overlay um, the prevalence, uh, onto the prevalence rates, uh, the subway stops. And, and the thing that jumps out here is in southeastern Bronx and southeastern Queens and southeastern Brooklyn, we see some of the highest rates and the subways don't touch there. Well, what's going on? It's very complex. We actually don't know the answer to that. But one possibility is that those folks are taking buses and buses are more confined space than a subway. So that's a hypothesis and that's something that we need to explore. But that's something that we only, only was only brought to our attention because we had spatial information. And this is zip code level data. Contact tracing, the key here is how to maintain privacy. And uh, believe it or not, um, this is a conceptual model that was proposed by myself and Karsten Kessler, a former professor at Hunter College. And this was proposed and I sent the email to uh, the Department of Health in New York City on February 3rd. Um, didn't get a lot of response other than sounds interesting, but this is February 3rd. Uh, the key here is that the user is tracking themselves. So there's a two week moving window. Um, and if a person is infected, the Department of Health will send that information to the user and they, that will be processed locally on their device or maybe a local server, uh, but not associated with the government. And they can see themselves if they've been in situations where they had uh, contact uh, with an infected individual. And they're like, you know, there's obviously different risk levels where you're in the same Starbucks or the subway or the bus. Uh, but you can make the decision to say, you know what, I should get checked out. I should get, um, you know, tested. So modeling and prediction, I think, is really key. Um, and we have, this is really the classic epidemiological model where we have susceptible individuals, we have infected individuals, and we have recovered individuals or past individuals. And... Um, as you can imagine, over a period of time, and it seems like it's two to three weeks, in susceptible, well, there's a, there's a transfer of one population to another, susceptible to infected, infected to recovered. Um, and we have ways that these individuals are moving through our world, the transportation system, and they have destinations that they're going to. Um, and what we want to do is understand the processes associated with this conceptual model. Now, the interesting thing is that if you look at the um, SIR model, there's two kind of really key coefficients. Uh, one is rho, how many individuals do I infect if I'm infected? And the other is really a diffusion factor because that model sort of assumes that everybody in the model is going to get exposed to the virus. Now, since I have a car scenario here, I brought up the coefficients that my model calculated for Los Angeles. And the model that I've created actually calculates these two coefficients for every county in the United States using New York Times data, which is in a proper format for modeling. It's a time series, unlike the Department of Health for New York, which does not provide a time series, even at the zip code level. I just requested it and I had 
they asked me to fill out these huge forms. I said, this is not just for me, this is for the community. So this is more like New York. We've got buses, we've got walkers. I uh, threw a plane in there, of course, we can imagine what that does. And you see that the, the uh, coefficients that were calculated by the model, uh, the rho is 2.62 and the diffusion is 10.6, which would mean that 10.6% of the population has either had the virus um, or is currently infected. Now I'm using death rates from South Korea because they have the best testing regime in the world. Uh, and those death rates are about 2.3%. Um, we don't know exactly what the death rate is, and obviously there's a lot of variation depending upon demographics, uh, but that's what was used in the model. So let's just take a look at the model. Um, it's an embedded recursive model because what it does is it embeds the recursion for calculating the row coefficient and the diffusion coefficient, uh, and they kind of fight with each other. Uh, one adjusts and that knocks out the other. And you can sort of think of like a ping pong table where it's going back and forth until it converges. And so here's on the bottom is the classic um, look of the SIR model with the susceptible individuals, the infected individuals, um, recovered individuals, and those that have passed. And here, um, we could think of this as the initial diffusion um, burst. You know, what percentage of the population was exposed? Um, now, obviously that's changing. And the real question is, how is it changing? Now, this is what it looks like when I take the diffusion rate, which is calculated from pre-lockdown conditions, and I apply it to post lockdown with a lag. You can see there's a lag there. Um, and I've taken 25% of that value. So one quarter of the rate. So I'm assuming one quarter of the rate, and I can't see it because these are in the way, but um, the death rate goes up to about 30,000 uh, by the end of August. Um, and so the real question is, um, so, so I'll back up a second because I'm sure some of you out there are saying, oh, wait a second, Sean, I haven't seen anything geographic yet. <laughs> and that's true. Um, because when I started thinking about this model, uh, the first thing I thought is, wow, there's a lot of bad data. Okay. Uh, the case counts are way off. If I model the case counts, I'm going to end up with modeling testing, how good they're testing in each county. So I'm actually using the death for modeling. Um, and I thought, you know, you've seen a lot of models out there that are data driven. And some of those models have been wildly off initially um, because a data driven model that's operating on data, which is problematic, is a problem. The second point is that there's ecological factors, the ecology of disease, epidemiology, which control this factor. And so if you're just using a data-driven model, you're not constrained by the ecology of the science. And I, that's why I chose the SIR model. It's obviously modified, but I've got these two coefficients now for the entire country, every county and every country. And now I'm going to look at geographic correlates associated with those two coefficients. So rather than saying which geographic factors are related to prevalence, I'm saying, let's model this phenomena, look at the two key coefficients which are affected by geographic phenomena, and then look at relationships. Okay, so um, this is what the model looks like. And so this is the initial condition that's tossed out at it. And then it goes into this recursive mode. And again, it's fighting between these two coefficients and it slowly converges on a fit. So that red line is the model fitting the data. And so keep in mind, this is different than curve fitting where you're, you're looking at different you know, polynomials to fit a curve. This is taking the SIR model and fitting those two coefficients to it and its shape. And you see for New York, it fits extremely well, partially because there's a lot of data. Uh, but if you look at the other cities, uh, the model also fits those extremely well. So 
we've got these two coefficients. I'll just go back for a second. And I said, how do we understand what's going to happen? Um, what is that rate of diffusion? What does rho look like? And now we have this new sources of movement data of individuals from apps that's been consolidated to capture movement from origin to destination, basically diffusion, right? Proximity of devices can be determined and quantified. That's basically rho. These data can be used to calibrate both diffusion and row going forward for specific geographic areas. And they can also be used for examining geographically specific interaction and diffusion. So um, Ubermeter was kind enough to give me a couple of slides and here's one of them. And this just shows the diffusion to and from Soho, the neighborhood of Soho in one day, extraordinary. So we can basically get real-time data as well as historical data and basically compare what happened before the lockdown, what are those how do, what's the relationship between those coefficients and this sort of movement data, and then we can use that to sort of calibrate the model going forward. And here's the other piece of this, which is proximity. And this actually shows two different malls, one Buckhead, um, which is the blue line and one underground Atlanta, which is the uh, orange line. And you're seeing that there's a lot more interaction uh, per device in the uh, underground Atlanta than Buckhead. So conclusion, the tools are available for monitoring and attenuating the spread of COVID-19. We can do this. Processes need to be put in place as the city opens up to ensure quality geocoded data. A contact proximity application needs to be implemented while maintaining privacy. Data on cases and deaths need to be available by the DOH in a form compatible with modeling, i.e. a time series. Not a big request. And you know, I'm initially happy with just zip code, but obviously we can do much better because there could be one building which has lax policies which are infecting an enormous number of people. So specif geographic specificity is critical. Real-time movement interaction data needs to be part of the solution. And that's my presentation. Thank you for listening. And again, congratulations to Gizmo. Um, and uh, thank you, Al and Amy, for organizing this uh, meeting. And, and thank you, Sean, for that presentation. Uh, I guess you could say that the Department of Health doesn't know what they're missing. It's, it's a shame. It's yeah. a shame. You've got huge resources in this city, major universities, a fabulous, you know, uh, civil servants uh, who can do these kind of work, yet the data is not accessible to us. It's, it's really shameful and, and not, not right. And I would just add that apparently it's happening across the country. And uh, it's, it's now been brought to, I guess, the highest level uh, of GIS authority in the country. Uh, the FGDC and the NGAC, and hopefully they'll be able to do something. Well, I hope so. You know, maybe this is, uh, well, I shouldn't say there needs to be a national policy, but given the circumstances, yeah. that might be, uh, you know, a, a challenge. Okay, thanks, Sean. Um, I'd like to bring on now uh, George Percival. Uh, George serves as the Chief Technology Officer and Chief Engineer of the Open Geospatial Consortium, which designs methods and models to make spatial data interoperable. It's an it's international standard-setting body, uh, and uh, we are so lucky and fortunate to have met them and met George and met the crew at OGC, and we are so happy that they wish to work with us on underground infrastructure data standards and to just continue that relationship wherever it may go. Uh, George has been the foundation of that relationship. Uh, it's a pleasure to welcome him back to Gizmo again because he had made a previous presentation. And uh, so George, without more ado, here, take it away. Thank you so much, Alan. Uh, it's always a pleasure to uh, participate in gizmo activities. I've been doing it for a few years and I've known Alan for 20 years now. Um, we'll reflect on, reflect on that a little bit later, but uh, let me tell you a little bit about, uh, we were right in the middle of uh, activity to describe geospatial data science when, like everyone else, 
uh, most of our activities are changed based on COVID. And so what I'll speak to you a little bit about now is uh, a, a model for geospatial data science where the application and the examples uh, are COVID-19. Um, so OGC uh, is a consortium, Gizmo is a member, um, and uh, we're a global consortium working around the globe on um, thought leadership for and innovation for all things related to uh, location. And so uh, one example of what we do is uh, this workshop that happened uh, last November on data science. So we conduct a series of workshops uh, called Location Powers. This one uh, was specifically about data science, uh, the data rich environment, uh, big data capabilities, uh, remote sensing, Internet of Things, um, and the ability to process at scale and do data science at scale like we've never been able to do before. And as you know, uh, most of that data has components of location and time. And so this was a discussion about uh, what does it make sense to do with respect to data science for geospatial information? Uh, we have uh, crafted a white paper out of that that'll be published next week um, and has this kind of summary of the, the, the framework with respect to uh, geospatial data science. The definition uh, given by the chief data officer of NGA, uh, the art and craft of people leveraging technology to create value out of data. So this is what you know people that work with GIS have been doing for a long time. Gizmo's been doing this for a long time. So you've been doing geospatial data science, right? Uh, and in fact, what you will see in this outline uh, that's down below is that a lot of topics are very familiar. Uh, you know, the tools, for example, geospatial analytics, that whole section is things that you eat and breathe every day using GIS. But there are some new things, machine learning in particular, that is really uh, transforming the way we do data science, geospatial data science. And then there's the development of models, knowledge-based models that can rapidly affect the way we do decision-making based upon location information. We had a, uh, quite a few application areas that also then brought out the topic of ethics associated with the use of that location data. Uh, the report has six or eight different application areas. Uh, for this, uh, we've now focused the application area of health, pandemics, COVID-19. Um, so these are the uh, topics of um, applying that data science model, uh, geospatial data science model to COVID-19 and the kind of the four points that I'll make here uh, as the, the heart of the discussion. First is data science is in a lot of ways telling stories about data. Uh, we have experts in data who want to be able to craft that and tell a story. Uh, we tell stories with maps, right? So uh, accurate use of maps. Um, pandemic outbreak and spread. Um, I'll make a contrast between uh, traditional models, um, very similar to what uh, Sean just presented, the SIR model, based upon you know, Bayesian statistics and the like, and the contrast to machine learning models that have become um, uh, cause celeb in some ways uh, for uh, COVID-19 uh, uh, predictions. Uh, contact tracing, uh, location versus proximity, two different ways to do contact tracing. Contact, sorry, misspelled, I do that regularly, contract. Contact tracing, uh, and we'll get into the discussion of that, and that really brings up uh, data ethics, uh, location ethics, privacy, and the like that has been transformed by uh, this discussion. So let's step through each of these. Some of them will be you know, quite familiar to you. This one I would think would be, accurately telling stories and conveying experiences about location data. So this is a good example of, um, you know, how you can tell different stories with maps. Uh, you guys know this, right? Not everybody knows this. So a big part about the uh, geospatial data science uh, white paper is to kind of tell folks the power of location, the power of maps, and also the, the, the need to be able to accurately tell stories of the geospatial data using maps. Uh, so one example here. The difference between traditional algorithms and machine learning. So, um, you know, what we know about traditional programs, it's uh, somebody taking a concept, a hypothesis, writing out a, a set of code, um, running that code on data and getting a result. Very traditional kind of way. In this example, it'll be, of course, uh, how a pandemic uh, and the SIR model, for example. Machine learning is quite different, right? So you have a capability that's able to learn based upon some training data. 
And so you, you sick the uh, uh, trained model on a big uh, data flow, a feed, and you identify the things that you might not have expected. And so we see unexpected results on occasion from machine learning. Um, we still have some lessons to learn with respect to how well they perform, how inspectable and analyzable they are, how biased they are on occasion, and how much we want to trust them. One of the key things that came out of the uh, data science workshop was that machine learning needs to be paired with a uh, multidisciplinary group to be able to come up with those results. So uh, when, what was the phrase? We can't tensor flow our way out of this problem kind of thing. So tools are not enough. Uh, but let me apply this to uh, COVID. So, um, you know, in particular with respect to uh, pandemics, disease outspread mo outbreak models, it's predictions that you're trying to make using a model. Models are always wrong. Sometimes they're useful. Uh, to, based on a current situation, and you're using those to judge and inform possible actions, health promotion messages in order to flatten the curve, for example. These models are based on the biology of the disease, the social sciences of behavior, a behavior, you know, people moving around and what they do, statistics to analyze the data, so Bayesian methods, uh, for example, uh, and geotemporal proximity and movement. Um, we're all familiar, of course, with the, uh, uh, the JHU website there that uh, has gotten a lot of press and the White House predictions. So, you know, how are these models done traditionally? Uh, you know, Sean just gave us a great example. I can't do any better <laughs> anywhere close to what Sean did. Uh, but, you know, this is the example. You write static code. You got a network population, uh, network model of the population dynamics. You've got some statistics model to infer the transmission rate that has uh, um, uh, coefficients that you're trying to tune. Uh, you use the data about reported infections. You use human mobility data at course level is what's been used for the most part. Um, you know, the Chinese data was... Um, it was actually pretty, they, they did actually get um, some higher resolution that is high precision data from apps uh, from the, uh, the Chinese uh, Tencent uh, uh, cluster of applications that are on Chinese, uh, on phones of China, folks in China. Um, results, predictions of exposed and infected populations. So the ability to uh, affect uh, behavior changes based upon those predictions. So contrast this traditional model uh, with machine learning models. And so here you've got some trained model and you're, you're scanning these feeds, a variety of types of information, and you're able to detect things at scale that you probably, you wouldn't be able to identify before. And there is actually a little bit of a hoopla about who uh, was able to use AI algorithms to predict or early predictions of COVID-19. Some of these claim uh, predicting the spread uh, outside of China as early as December 29th, 30th, 31st, something like that. So Health Map, Blue Dot, and Metabiota have all, you know, put out articles with respect to how they were able to um, identify uh, that this was spreading and make predictions based upon air travel data in particular with, um, uh, with one of them. Uh, yeah, and so, you know, a lot of discussion about this. Again, not real sure that uh, we understand all these. There's a lot of critique of the machine learning algorithms and what they've done. They clearly bring some value, um, but how much do you trust them versus others? This is a healthy debate that's going to go on beyond this pandemic uh, and beyond. So, you know, machine learning and its effect and where we're going with respect to geospatial data. Let's talk about contact tracing. A couple of different ways to do this, uh, location-based uh, versus proximity-based. So location-based relies upon high accuracy location tracking, like opt-in location-based services apps. Uh, so your phone has the ability to give, you know, meter, five meter accuracy uh, tracings of where you've been and where you're going. And so you compare trajectories to determine nearness. You know, how, where, who was close in space and time, right? Uh, and you got to make a calculation to do that, and you know you've you've got along a trace of all of these um, um, trajectories of individuals through space and time with the location-based tracking. Compare that with proximity-based, uh, in particular the one that's most popular probably is the Google and Apple one that's based on Bluetooth. 
Uh, and so you're able, the phones are able to detect that they're in proximity with each other uh, for a certain duration. So you get a sense of who you're close to. Uh, that relationship is identified between who's um, engaged in that proximity, but also the time of that duration of that proximity. Uh, and you're able to identify uh, contact with infected uh, individuals determined by proximity. Both of these approaches have issues with respect to, in particular, privacy. Um, and so uh, one of the things that came out of this uh, whole discussion we had about <clears throat> data science uh, was uh, ethics, uh, IT ethics for geospatial data. Uh, Wendy Martinez, who is uh, the head chief scientist for Bureau of Labor Statistics, uh, who led the application section at the uh, summit last November, gave us this outline uh, <clears throat> based upon her research, ethics of data, ethics of algorithms, ethics of practices. And so the data itself, there is ethics with respect to the collection and access of these large data sets and re-identification of individuals based on location. What is, somebody just reminded me earlier this week in another webinar <laughs> uh, that it takes four space-time location points to identify anybody, right? That's all you need. It's pretty darn easy. Uh, and so re-identification kind of is, you know, you got to protect this data, right? The ethics of the algorithms. You need to understand what the algorithm is doing, so understandability, and try to assess its bias. Um, and that's really becoming more and more challenging with the complexity and autonomy machine learning of algorithms. And then practice. Uh, ethics of practice. What do you do with the data? What do you do with the algorithms? You know, how are you using secondary use, integration of data sets from multiple locations, unintended use? So this is a framework that Wendy provided to us uh, that we can now apply to a discussion about ethics with COVID, right? Uh, so ethics of data, the proximity pro protocols require less personal location information than location-based tracking apps. So this is a statement that uh, gets discussed quite a bit. Um, there's also the issue of what you do with either of those, the proximity data or the location-based data, and how that information is shared. There's a whole debate, uh, these acronyms refer to a debate in Europe about centralized versus decentralized databases of proximity contacts. And so just saying proximity is not enough to have a complete discussion about what is the, um, the protection that you have with respect to the data. Algorithms, ethics of algorithms, artificial intelligence, uh, you know, what is it really telling us um, and uh, how much can we trust them to really affect uh, um, the, 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 the direction that we're telling people to take. Um, ethics of practices, um, are you using it uh, in a way that was not intended? Is that okay? Maybe it is, you know, right? We need as a society to make those choices about um, the ethics of using that data, which really gets to this Wall Street Journal quote um, down below. COVID-19 pandemic has ushered in a new era of digital surveillance and rewiring the world's sensibilities about data privacy. We need to make that, you know, we need to look at that with our eyes open. We need to make choices collectively, understand what we're doing and move forward with uh, policies that, uh, that uh, we're comfortable with, right? That are reflecting of our values in our society. Um, so that's what I have with respect to the application of data science to COVID-19. You know, this gets discussed in our health domain uh, working group. Um, there is a white paper on health spatial data infrastructure um, and that I refer you to and, uh, you know, led up by uh, a guy that's an expert in this area. So uh, this will be discussed further there. Look forward to the New York City results being discussed there as well. Um, I thank you for your time, uh, but allow me to add my um, uh, thanks, my best wishes to Gizmo. My story will be about Alan and I met after 9-11 because of the issue of data interoperability. And I heard Jack's comment earlier in this session that really hit on that. Uh, we ended up taking uh, Alan's uh, uh, use cases, if you will, into the OGC's innovation program and prototyping activities to drive what became, you know, some of the most significant web map service, web map tile service, web feature service, web coverage service, all of that. Um, so thanks to Gizmo, thanks to Alan, thanks to all of you in New York City who are indeed leaders of geospatial information uh, in the globe today. So cheers. Cheers.
Thank you, George. And um, I, I think from all the presenters, you've all gotten a pretty good slice of where Gizmo is, the talent that Gizmo can attract, and the future of GIS, which is very rich and very promising with all these new technologies and techniques and uh, types of intelligence coming to bear. And we're trying to be in the middle of that um, and to promote that and to learn about it. So again, thanks a lot. Um, I'd like to move on to the next um, part of the program, which is audience participation. Dara, I guess, um, I don't know if you want to show your image, uh, but um, Dara Mendeloff, a uh, uh, board member of Gizmo. Um, she serves as a specialist for SISEN, uh, the Columbia University Center for International Earth Science Information Network. Dara is a long-standing member of the Gizmo board and has led the Gizmo Open Data Initiative. And she will start to take questions, comments from uh, the audience. So with that, I surrender the screen and give it up to Dara. If she's here, and <laughs> I know she is. Noreen, Amy, Dara. Okay. D Dara, maybe unmute and say a few words. I think we lost Dara. Um, I don't see her on the list. Noreen, you're up. <laughs> okay. Um, I, if she comes back, I'll reintroduce her. But uh, the way we're going to do this is if people have questions, uh, use the raise hand uh, function and I will look for the blue hands and we'll unmute your mic and the person who wants to answer the question uh, can answer the question. So do we have any questions? I don't see any yet. Uh, we have a question from Juliana. She's asked, will the slides be made available afterwards? Yes, I assume so, is Al speaking. Oops, yes. As long as the presenters wish to give them up. Certainly, George. Yeah, I don't seem to see any questions. Maybe we've answered them all. <laughs> or comments. Here we have one from Joshua Lieberman. Hi, Joshua. He's asking, how have the open data movement in New York City and Gizmo influenced each other? Dara is actually the one who could answer that question. But you held that open data meeting with Dara, right? So Noreen. That's right. Um, it's so much has happened over the last few months. I, I <laughs> nearly forgotten that we hosted an event up at Columbia University with a number of people who were, um, who were, uh, oh, here's Dara. We're gonna, we're gonna bring her in so that she can be part of this conversation. Who were really interested in how this city and how citizens in the city and how data people, data science people um, can work with the city to find new ways to um, give access to the data, to put the data into a format that's usable um, and to share the data. Uh, so that was a really, um, a really fun, deep, interesting, fascinating um, event. And let me make sure that Dara's on. Uh, Dara, do you want to say something about the event that we held up at uh, Columbia? Sure. Uh, first, apologies for my internet connection dying. You guys all know uh, once you're on stage in the technical world, uh, yeah. that's when things go wrong. So, of course, I'm sorry my internet died. Um, yeah, so what was it? In November, we hosted... Um, a New York City open data event up at Columbia. Um, and I think it was a fantastic opportunity to discuss exactly what was brought up at this um, during all these presentations, that data from New York City is an issue. 
Um, so thanks for the reminder. I, I guess we need to write up some notes and synthesize all mm -hmm. those, those thoughts that were presented. <laughs> um, but yeah, it was a great event and I hope that we continue that as well as, um, you know, these, dis these discussion points. And I think those are some of the things that I guess we want to hear from you right about now is um, what are your, I guess, um, what is your vision for GIS and data in the future, given that we kind of just went over the 30 years um, and Gizmo's involvement with GIS in the city and where um, George, Sean, Jack, um, and all of our other presenters have kind of identified data as being a, at the forefront of, of GIS in the future. What do you all think um, the future of GIS will be? So um, are we ready for the Q&A? Yeah, we're, we're starting that. That was the first question. <laughs> OK. So if you'd like to respond, you can raise your hand in your participant chat. And we'd love to hear from you. This is, this is Frank. Um, I'm on an old uh, version of Zoom, and I don't see my raise hand button. But um, I'll uh, comment to your question. Um, we're going to see that that uh, decisions are being made where data is available. That's economic activity. And if your data is behind a password, your constituents are left out of a segment of the economy. So we're going to see mass market drivers eventually um, uh, drive things in the right direction. And we're seeing cases um, and we're documenting cases where um, development is happening and where data is available and places that have their data behind a password or a licensing agreement have been uh, disconsidered uh, or not considered um, just because of the competitive nature of uh, real estate development and this sort of thing. So that also goes to the expectation of the new workforce that we're seeing. My kids don't call for a pizza, yet they get pizza, right? When they're asked to do GIS analysis, they're not going to make a phone call and call your economic development or sign a license agreement. They're going to find a web service and they're going to have their job done without a phone call. So uh, those things are going to converge and we're going to see data open just because it has to in order to participate in the economy. Any uh, responses or additional responses to that? Sean, I think it looks like you're going to speak. Sure, Dara. Um, I think the biggest change is going to be real-time data. Um, you know, everybody's carrying a sensor. Um, you know, it, it's becoming so powerful, and it can be used to almost in real time calibrate models. Um, and, and I think COVID nineteen is a perfect example of that, where we don't know how the coefficients that determine the trajectory of the disease will play out um, unless we have that real-time data and we have that real-time data. So I believe that changes everything in terms of how we do modeling. Thanks, Sean. Anybody else? So maybe Why don't we continue going around with the uh, the pre presenters? So yes, George, you next. Yeah, sure. So um, you know maybe back back to Sean. I, you know I saw the data that you used, uh, or I saw you know what you described the data you used coming from the city, um, and I do know that for example Google makes certain amount of data available through community sharing program at a certain level of resolution. Um, is that valuable? to you? Is it available to I mean, it is available. Whether or not it meets your needs, I guess, is really the question. But it seems like there's a lot of private data that could be used in addition to the city's data. Right. So I've been working a bit talking with uh, Uber Media. Uh, those are the two slides I showed. And yeah. so they are very careful about anonymizing their data. But for instance, the two coefficients that I talked about, rho, which looks at interaction, and the other is diffusion, those can be 
calibrated using the real-time data, even in its anonymous form. Because, you know, you can really think of those two coefficients as integrators of a whole bunch of stuff that's going on. You know, where people live, the density of the housing, the transportation mode, and where their destinations are, whether it's, you know, um, a restaurant, a business, or a demonstration. Uh, so those two coefficients are really integrator of all those things. And so if we're able to then take that, you know, proximity data as a metric related to those coefficients, as well as dispersion, then I think we've got something. And, and, and uh, you know, that's going to help us understand which way this, this what is the trajectory of this, uh, you know, of this, of this uh, virus. You know, this outline there, I wonder if I could call on Josh Lieberman to talk a, a few minutes, maybe about the underground infrastructure work uh, that he's done. He's, he's, uh, all, he's also working with the Ordnance Survey in Great Britain, which is uh, starting, uh, which has a pilot of uh, mapping underground infrastructure. So Josh, are you, are you there? Can you, can you speak about this? And can he be unmuted? Oh, it looks like I'm unmuted here. Yep. So yeah, I'll turn on a video. There we go. Uh, yeah. So uh, first of all, you know, I really need to thank Alan, but uh, many other members of the New York City GIS community for going out on some limbs <laughs> and into some excavations to uh, really put this together. And, uh, you know, it's a remarkable situation because, uh, as Alan documented in the course of, of looking at this issue, you know, the, the costs of not knowing what's underground are huge. The benefits of learning what's underground are undeniable. And yet there's this cultural situation where, you know, you can have a fire hydrant, right, on the street. And you know, everybody can see it. So, you know, put it on a map. You can have a pipe that's three feet underneath that fire hydrant and nobody will give you information about that because that's sensitive and, you know, could result in uh, uh, terrorist action. So the, uh, you know, agreement of people and, you know, the Fund for the City of New York did support this, but also a lot of people that do it and other agencies that said, yeah, you're right, that's ridiculous. Let's push on ahead and see what we can do in terms of characterizing uh, the assets and you know, quantifying the benefits and also saying, you know, how much do we need to know to really get these benefits? How much do we need to know to make digging much safer? How much do we need to know to be more resilient to disasters, to know what the vulnerabilities are. So uh, one of the aspects of this has been to recognize that, you know, this is one of those cases of the old joke about standards, right? I, I love geospatial standards because there are so many of them. Uh, and in this case, people look at the infrastructure of the city in so many different ways that there's a standard for each one of the ways to do that. Um, and it was great of uh, people involved in this concept development study and subsequent workshop to say, you know, I'm going to risk having one more standard in order to be able to take a view across those different perspectives and link up the data that different groups have collective for different purposes. So there's now a activity in OGC to make what we learned about uh, tracking underground utilities and uh, structures and transport facilities, uh, something we've continued on with uh, Deborah Layford at NYU, to turn that into a standard that allows the technologies and the knowledge and also the knowledge of what works to go across these different industries and around the world. So uh, one of the things we discovered looking around the world is that you can have technology, 
you know, a knowledge about spatial um, science, you can have enormous benefits. You can have, you know, ways and people interested in collecting information, but somewhere along the way, somebody has to say you have to. Uh, that's what we learned in uh, Belgium, in Flanders, you know, okay. Uh, so you have to do this. It's a good idea, but you also have to. And in the UK, the Geospatial Commission, which is this new um, body, uh, cabinet level body in the UK with sort of a vague mission, um, went out and said, wave money at two regions of the country and said, let's see what we can do to make digging safer. And uh, so took this technology, which was developed with the help of New York City and worked on social engineering. So that was the great thing is spatial social engineering in order to bring the utility horses to water <laughs> and say, mm -hmm. you know, you could drink this and just see how it tastes. And what was remarkable is when they started to get the idea, oh, this, you know, we know what our data is maybe, but we don't know anything about those other utilities. And uh, that's actually pretty useful. So now we hope that that social experiment can, by way of the supporters in New York City and uh, the, you know, sort of standard um, consensus that OGC brings will let this value be more further realized in New York City. And Gizmo is going to play a, a huge part of that and bringing those supporters together. So thanks a lot. Thank you. Dara, do you want to call on someone arbitrarily just to be cruel about it? <laughs> yeah. Uh, you, am I on? It's Jack. <laughs> A lot has happened. I call on you, Jack. <laughs> so well done, a lot Jack. has happened in the last 30 years. 30 years ago, data wasn't considered something to be shared. It was something proprietary and owned by people, including the different departments of New York City government. We make money off of it. We'll be able to sell it to other departments, not just to other departments, not that, but we'll be able to sell it to the private sector. Somewhere around 15 years, I was part of a committee for open data in New York City. And we had people from not just from Gizmo, but from all over, all over city government that challenged that notion. That data was something to be proprietarily owned. But the real strength of sharing data is not just in, in, in being able to be used, for the data to be able to be used in different contexts. It's to be able to help correct each other's data by, by using other departmental de department's data, we can find errors in another, a different department's data. There's so many good reasons to combine data sets between agencies besides be able to use the data. But the one problem is that when you use data from another agency, you better understand how that data was collected. You better understand the metadata of that data. In other words, the data that describes that data. So many people indiscriminately use data without understanding what it really means. Yes, that is very true. Um, metadata, metadata is brought up uh, not enough. I would say that if that's my response to that question of what, what the future brings and what it should look like, uh, we need more metadata. Um, so I think there are a lot of common threads in this conversation. And um, I think when we're talking about the modeling and machine learning, um, I guess the difference, I think George, you were talking about the difference between traditional algorithms and machine learning, and that machine learning is this kind of new technology that we can kind of treat it like a washing machine where you, you don't really know what's going to come out of it. It might be something that you didn't expect. 
this kind of exploratory analysis in modeling. And I think that's really important um, because that's the trend in data science right now, right? Um, and that's a disadvantage that we have from our data availability, right? We talked a lot about the temporal and spatial resolution of information and the lack of, of that. Um, so is that, um, I'm kind of losing my, my train of thought, but there's, there's some synthesis that needs to be made there about the ability to just play with different data. And the, maybe we're not the folks to find the errors and make the corrections in the data, but those same agencies and private companies that are withholding that data might also be um, limiting our ability to kind of let these models um, find new patterns. Um, does that make sense to anybody? I certainly would uh, support your suggestion that uh, without a lot of data, machine learning is kind of dull and boring, right? <laughs> um, you know, so open data, uh, which, you know, as Jack was reflecting and others as well, has really become a significant change in our, um, our way of doing the data science that we do, right? Um, my background's remote sensing, it was Landsat data became available. Uh, used to be a you know a thousand dollars a scene. It was like five thousand a scene or something like that in the nineties. It was just so ridiculous. And they figured out that um, you know let's just turn this on, let's just make it available. And you know that availability of Landsat data uh, for free at scale was really the the oil <laughs> that drives the engine, which is machine learning. Uh, without that data, you, uh, you know, machine learning it isn't as strong, right? Uh, but it does bring us back to the questions of how effective is that machine learning? How um, resilient is it to variations in the data if there's errors in the data or if you start with different data? Uh, training sets are really key. And so, you know, in the, in the particular, in the, in the, uh, the use of that data for health, you know, what, what recommendations are you going to make? I know that New York City, for example, has had a, um, 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 a committee, a study group, may have been shut down now, but it was specifically about uh, looking at algorithms, um, AI algorithms that were used for allocation of resources. And um, the challenge there was people couldn't even define, you know, it was tough to define what machine learning means and what data and the like. So, you know, those are the kinds of social issues that we need, not only on data, but also on our algorithms so that uh, we, can, we can have trust in that, uh, the, the results that we get and the decisions we make. Yeah, if I could comment, Tara. Um, yes, please. You made some great points. Um, I, I, I always say never underestimate the value of a strong conceptual model. And I'm not sure these things are mutually exclusive. You can, you can have an ecologically informed model that's using machine learning to sort of fit it or calibrate it. Um, so I think those two things can work together. There's obviously some things which are pure machine learning, image recognition or feature recognition, um, you know, where neural networks are actually creating not one sort of model of the phenomena, but you know, 50 or 100 or 1,000, uh, which is why I can tell a cat from all those different angles. So I think, you know, these two things, I, I'm not sure that we want to separate them and say, well, we either do these formal models or we do the machine learning. I think you can use both types of approaches. And, and as I said before, and I, I truly believe it, the reason some of those data-driven AI type models failed and in some cases uh, predicted twice as many deaths as actually happened is that they weren't ecologically informed because the ecology of the disease does constrain what's possible and we should never forget that. Thank you, John. Uh, I see your hand, Josh. Yeah, I was just gonna add in that uh, there's actually a very concrete use case for the combination of models that, uh, and this is actually a, a side effect of the GDPR uh, regulations that 
you know, a decision that's model based needs to be explainable. You know, so, you know, what were the factors that caused me to be turned down for this, you know, benefit or application? And uh, the, you don't get those explanations for most machine learning models. So the approach that uh, is being taken now is to actually build a, a conventional model around the solution that the machine learning model provides that does indicate, you know, what are the explanatory variables and how uh, significant they are and so on. So uh, there's actually a very clear use case for working with both of them and letting the machine learning model bring you to a more useful uh, functional or traditional model. Just to read out loud um, George's response. Well said, Sean, hypothesis-driven machine learning is a key innovation in research area. Um, somebody in the chat mentioned uh, Mary. Florida was using ways data reports of street construction to validate their work permits and catch unauthorized work. Mary, do you want to sure. say more about that? Mary, you're unmuted if you'd like to say something about that. Okay, maybe not. Maybe not. We'll come back. I'll chime in on it. Oh, if I found my mic. Oh, there we go. <laughs> can you hear me? We can hear you. Mary, you're never at a loss for words. What's going on? <laughs> Mary Susan, yes. Uh, sorry, they were, you asked about how data could check itself. Um, mathematics. Uh, oh, sorry, a little mic problem, Alan. Um, the, it, I always loved math because you could get the answer multiple ways if you were really working the data. Add them, if you want to check your work, subtract them, vice versa. I, the Cornell answer, uh, Bird study was stunning to me that they proved the 30% die off in songbirds with two different data sets. So that's impressive to me. So when you can get independent data sets and they can inform each other, and that's why I typed in the ways example because I thought that's great. That's private sector data bounced off public sector data and both are better for it. And you can do more clever things because you have access to both. So it just reinforces the, yeah, data that you can't get to doesn't help anybody. Point. Cheers. And congratulations to Gizmo from the New York State GIS Association. <laughs> we <laughs> wouldn't you. be here without the mutual aid, comfort, and encouragement. And <laughs> bravo, you proved that a, a Zoom conference can be a, a wonderful success. So bravo, everyone who made this happen. Thank you. Cheers. Are there any other comments from the Gizmo members? Um, one other question I had for, for everybody was um, fondest memories of Gizmo in the past 30 years. I saw that there was somebody in the chat, uh, I'm not sure I can find it, um, who said that they met their, their wife at a Gizmo presentation in the year 2002. If that person's still on, would you like to tell that story? That's George Davis. Is George still here? I just asked him to un oh. Yeah, I'm unmuted now. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, George. Please do. Okay. I can hear you. 
Uh, first of all, Jack, thank you for what you put together here, because if it wasn't for Gizmo, I wouldn't have met Miriam. I picked Miriam up uh, when she had come to visit Dr. Grossman, Old Grossman in New York City, and said to her, and she didn't really speak much English back then, you want to come to a meeting with us? And we brought her to the, to the Gizmo meeting, and we were married in May the following year, and we've been happily married now for 17 years, thanks to that good meeting. Jack, thank you very much. My phone is ringing at the same time. Uh, also, I'd like to thank New York State uh, Auto Photo Program for the auto photo backdrop that I'm using as my backdrop. I've been testing out my new 4K camera to see how it works. So if you keep seeing me going on and off, I've been kind of listening and playing with my new camera. So um, I've been happy, happy to be a Gizmo member for a long time. I'm probably the furthest one away right now in upstate New York. Uh, you're looking at the Champlain Canal in Whitehall, New York. It's a backdrop. And uh, yeah, thanks for having me. Thanks for sharing, George. Just in time for the 7 p.m. Cheers to health and essential workers. Yes, cheers to cheers to everybody. Um, other comments? Everybody's pretending to be quiet. You have to virtually imagine yourself that we're all in the same room together. You all would be chatting up a storm, I'm sure. Well, maybe we should call it a day. <laughs> Dara, should we should we put an end to it? One final. How about um? Sean. How about last words from from all of the presenters? Well, I'd look, just like to thank uh, Jack and Gizmo for, for being our mainstay, you know, for all these years and, and giving us coherence. I think we actually need another burst of like, it's kind of hard to do in, in our dispersed environments, but I think we need another burst to, uh, to pull things back together. The idea that TOH is totally divorced from what the rest of the city is doing and what the research community is up to, is not a good thing. It's something that we really should try to change. Uh, thanks, Sean. This has been a wonderful experience for me. And during the same period of time, much of the same period of time that I was associated with Gizmo, I was also associated with the geography department at Hunter College, where I've been treated very nicely and remembered very nicely. And one of the things I've done at Hunter College is endow a prize through the best student field work done every year. And we had that meeting virtually yesterday. Yeah, the Oak, the Oak Tree Prize. And what I have to remind everyone is that geography is much more than GIS. Geography is four things. It's a physical science. It's a social science. It's a humanity in the same way that history is, except you're talking about space and you're just writing about regions and places. And it's an art, and the art is cartography made into a science with GIS. And I went into geography because it didn't limit me in a way. It just enabled me to do whatever I wanted to. And it embraced all of these things. And, uh, those of you who are just buried in GIS, I encourage you to get outside and do your field work and understand this earth firsthand, as well as through the stats that you manipulate. Well, Jack, I don't know if you remember this, but we were at a meeting and I think it had something to do with real estate and everybody went around the room talking about what GIS was and everything. And you said, no, 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 it, it's not, geography isn't about things, it's about relationships. And it's about relationships in space, time, and over different scales. And GIS is a tool that enables us to analyze that in a new way. I still remember that quote. That was like 15 years ago that I heard you say that. And I, I still use that one. So thank you.
Well, you're welcome, John. It's been a pleasure to know you all this time. Wow, that was great. Uh, as a speaker, I guess Sarah was asking for each of us. Uh, I see she's gone offline a little bit, but um, that interaction of Sean and Jack right there is exemplary, what I've seen of Gizmo. Um, and the coming together and the, you know, people that George talking about uh, is, uh, you know, uh, meeting his spouse and everything there. Um, uh, you know, and what Josh said earlier, too, is really key that uh, he and I uh, came to, you know, work uh, on some really specific problems um, supported by Gizmo, in particular the underground and some other things. Uh, but underground is a really good example, as he said, of how. Uh, New York City is leading the way with respect to some really key advancements. And so, um, you know, let's keep, let's, uh, uh, we got to do more. Uh, there's hard problems to be solved and location and geography is an amazing tool to do that. So um, another 30 years. Let me add something here. If there's a place to study that may be ahead of us, it's Singapore. Uh, I visited the people behind the GIS in Singapore. Singapore is a very progressive, well-run place. And that goes for their GIS system as well. And they sort of have an advantage is that because they're on an island and they're separate from everybody and <laughs> get their act together more easily than us. We just kind of splurf and overlap with, uh, with our neighbors. And they're, they're, they're quite separate, but it's a very interesting place. And I want to encourage anyone who has any contacts with Singapore to, to make them aware of what we're doing here. They came to the workshop that Alan organized for Underground, the very first one. Singapore came because they knew that what was going to go on with Alan and the city was going to be relevant to what they're doing. They're, they're absolutely a, you know, a shining star in what they're doing. You know, digital twin modeling and the like is amazing. And they are using the muddy model that Josh has uh, developed and the like. So, good. yeah, agree completely. We got to keep that coordination globally is, is very important too. I mean, I, I would just like to say um, that the experience of working with OGC has been amazing because they really do open up the entire world to us where we can be influenced and learn, and we can also extend our influence to them. Uh, if you look at the membership in OGC, you'll see just about every country in the world, uh, many, many local governments, many uh, states. Um, it's a wonderful community. It's a sort of extension of, of Gizmo, only on the world stage. So it's, it, it's a great relationship. I'm, I'm very pleased that we have that. Frank, did you want to say Frank, something? any last words? Yeah, so I'm just so grateful to, uh, like I started, to, to be included here. And um, words of advice, particularly for students, um, the top people in the fields, whichever field you're in, love to geek out about what they're doing. Don't be afraid to, to connect with them and don't be afraid to call them and, and, um, uh, and make those connections. And it's the connections and you know, you mentioned the connections between phenomena and geography. It's the connections between people that really make all this work, irregardless of the policies or the politics or the budgets or anything else. We can make things happen just because we connect. So um, Gizmo has uh, really um, sparked that in me, and, and, uh, and I'm grateful for that as well. Thank you, Frank. How about Wendy? Any closing remarks, Wendy? Yeah, I could say I agree with a lot that's been said here. I think we've made a lot of strides. I think it's very difficult, but I think what makes it all wonderful is that we have a community of people who know all kinds of things that ultimately being cohesive helps us to really accomplish. And I think for myself, I mean, I, can, I think I can speak for many of you, part of why I've been able to continue this long in the face of very many uh, unexpected defeats in the process is that I, I know what's out there. I know what's possible. I mean, I, you guys have skills that I really don't have, but I, I, know, I know what I'm seeing in 
and what talent is out there to help it happen if we could pave the way with the people who have the power to uh, say yes. So uh, I look forward, uh, even after all these years, to some good good advances in the not too future, in the not too distant future. And I think you're all terrific. I love being with you this way and in person. <laughs> and uh, I think this turned out to be quite amazing and uh, really much better than I think maybe we're getting used to it, but we shouldn't get too used to it. I think it's good to be together as well. And Jack, you did, you've done a great thing. I mean, it really, the people thing is terrific. And I think it keeps us all going because we care and share. And uh, 30 more. And again, as I have to say before, the, the, board, the new board is fantastic. I'm really glad that the, we've got some younger people on it now to carry on. And I have, a, I feel very positive that we're going to have some new gains. Happy 30th, Gizmo. Happy 30th, Gizmo. Um, I, I think uh, we've covered everybody. So I, I guess I would just like to say uh, thank you, Gizmo. Um, happy 30th. Thank you, Jack, for, for being the pioneer. Um, it's been really fantastic being a part of, of this group. And I think no matter what the technical or data issues are, uh, wherever we see GIS going in the future, it really comes down to people and people like us. It's all about being able to communicate with our community. And so I hope that Gizmo maintains that being that place for us to communicate with each other um, because that's the only way forward is just talking with each other and working it out. So thank you for the opportunity to have this community. Okay, and I guess um, I'll finish it off. Um, kudos all around. I want to mention Amy Jew, the magician behind the scenes here, yeah, who right. helped pull this all together. Uh, Noreen, who was uh, the, the front end here. Uh, uh, Camille, who supported uh, getting everyone in on the site. Uh, Dara, for conducting uh, the, uh, the questions and answers and comments. And um, you know, to the whole board, thank you for your dedication and your work. Uh, we've got 30 more years to go at least, at least in the invisible future. So let's go for it. And um, I'll see you at the next webinar, I guess. <laughs> so good night, uh, be safe, be good. And hopefully we'll get over this coronavirus thing as Wendy suggested so that we can all come together again, which is really what we want to do is see each other in person. So uh, until then, um, take care and good night. All right, thanks, Al. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.